so to stay on the theme of evolutionary biology and um, complexity theory, I thought I'd read a little excerpt from Brian Goodwin's book, How the Leopard Changed Its Spots, The Evolution of Complexity. Uh, Goodwin's a biologist at the Open University in England. Uh, this section is called The Myth Behind the Metaphors. The story of the success of genetics and molecular biology in making sense of evolution at the basic level of molecules and genes has been told many times, but one of the most interesting and influential versions is contained in Richard Dawkins' books The Selfish Gene, The Extended Phenotype, and The Blind Watchmaker. These are powerful, persuasive presentations of genocentric biology whose clarity of exposition is enhanced by the metaphors used to vivify the science. These metaphors are themselves revealing because they are not just arbitrary coloring applied to a monochromatic scientific discourse. They actually belong in a very direct and intimate way to the ideas, informing them with relevant associations and reflecting the deeper myths which, with which the science resonates. First, there is the selfish gene metaphor. Of course, genes are not selfish, but they behave as if they were. The capacity of DNA to make copies of itself gives it the property of a replicator that is seen as the basis of organisms' capacity to increase exponentially and transmit genes from generation to generation. Better genes make better characteristics. That is, the organisms with these characteristics have a better chance of surviving and transmitting these genes to their progeny. So genes, via the organisms they produce, are constantly trying to leave more copies of themselves. In this process, organisms compete with one another for scarce resources, as Darwin described. But in the selfish gene, Dawkins shows how not only competitive, but also apparently cooperative behavior of organisms such as parental care and social organization, are really the result of every gene looking out for itself and trying to increase its numbers. Then, at the end of the book, comes the interesting surprise. Quote, We are built as gene machines and cultured as meme machines, but we have the power to turn against our creators. We, alone on earth, can rebel against the tyranny of the selfish replicators. End quote. So human beings, alone among the species, have the possibility of, quote, deliberately cultivating and nurturing pure, disinterested altruism, close quote. Culture can triumph over nature in this one species. It is not entirely clear how an organism constructed by selfish genes for their own perpetuation by whatever means they can devise can escape their cunning influence. How can such autonomy, such freedom to choose altruistic behavior, arise unless it, too, is of benefit to the genes that generate this property? In which case, again, altruism is really self-interest. However, I'm not going to pursue these questions here. They will come back in another context in later chapters. Dawkins' description of the Darwinian principles of evolution can be summarized as follows. 1. Organisms are constructed by groups of genes whose goal is to leave more copies of themselves. The hereditary material is selfish. 2. The inherently selfish qualities of the hereditary material are reflected in the competitive interactions between organisms that result in survival of fitter variants generated by the more successful genes. 3. Organisms are constantly trying to get better, i.e. fitter. In a mathematical, geometrical metaphor, they are always trying to climb up local peaks in a fitness landscape to do better than their competitors. However, this landscape keeps changing as evolution proceeds, so the struggle is endless. 4. Paradoxically, humans can develop altruistic qualities that contradict their inherently selfish nature by means of educational and other cultural efforts. Does this look familiar? Here's a very similar list of principles from another domain. One. Humanity is born in sin. We have a base inheritance. 2. Humanity is therefore condemned to a life of conflict. And 3. Perpetual toil. 4. By faith and moral effort, humanity can be saved from its fallen, selfish state. So we see that, Dar that the Darwinism described by Dawkins, whose exposition has been very widely, but by no means universally, acclaimed by biologists, 
has its metaphorical roots in one of our deepest cultural myths, the story of the fall and redemption of humanity as offered in Christianity. Dawkins did not invent this evolutionary story, he just tells it with great care and inspiration, in terms that clarify the underlying ideas of Darwinism. And what we see so clearly revealed is a myth with which we are all utterly familiar. So now we can begin to see what Darwin did, and from a different perspective. He certainly was guilty of heresy regarding the theological version of the fall and redemption story, because he had no place for God or the human spirit in his version of the origin of species. For him, creativity is in living matter itself. The capacity of life to generate an indefinite diversity of forms, of species, is intrinsic to this state of organization of matter, and no transcendental spirit is required to animate it and give it form. But once this crucial step had been taken, the rest of the story remained much the same as before. Competition, struggle, work, and progress. Darwin saw this as the path to civilization and to culture as revealed in an interesting comment he made about the natives of Tierra del Fuego, whom he commented, whom he encountered during his South American voyage on the Beagle. He noticed that the possessions the Fuegians had acquired from members of the ship's company had been divided equally among all. Darwin saw this as cooperative savagery and remarked, quote, the perfect equality of all the inhabitants will for many years prevent their civilization until some chief arises who by his power can heap up possessions for himself, there must be an end to all hopes of bettering their condition. Of course, there is nothing specifically theological about such views, except for the intimacy of the relationship between the work ethic in our culture and the notion of redemption by good works. Darwin's theology was more of the natural kind, the view espoused by Paley that adaptation of species to their habitats is one of the most striking features of the biological realm. But instead of seeing this as evidence of the Creator, Darwin viewed this as evidence of the power of natural selection, which became his creative principle. Darwin's heresy was to materialize these theological propositions, but otherwise the basic set of ideas and metaphors remained intact. These can be seen in any popular exposition of Darwinism, and their emergence in Dawkins' writing is simply a recent example. So, you know, take that for what you will. Uh, let me know what you think. I know it'll make some of you unhappy. Some of you will be uh, very excited about it. Um, either way, it's, this is a good book to read. You know, I like to read uh, both sides of every uh, controversy, which is why I'll read The Complexity Biologists, I'll read Dawkins, I'll read Dennett. Uh, and I'll form my own opinion based on the very cogent arguments made by both sides. And I recommend that everybody interested in talking about evolution do the same. Otherwise, there is really no discussion that we can have. Um, you must be well read in all uh, in all competing paradigms. Otherwise, you're, you're not really talking about anything. Uh, you're not really contributing to the ongoing discovery of new scientific truths. So. Um, yeah, take that for what you will, and uh, let me know what you think. Thanks for listening.